Hi, I'm Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard Paint where we grow cool plants and today we're going to be talking about the importance of growing California native plants in your garden. We're here in California but if you're in Hong Kong, China, you need to be looking for your Hong Kong, China native plants to be putting in your garden. I'm going to explain to you shortly and why that's important. And also we're going to be talking about different kinds of pest control to be using in your garden. We're going to be talking about the importance of using repellents versus using traps versus using poisons and what are the best choices and why. So hang tight, we're going to be starting shortly. First thing I want to ask, and it may sound silly, are plants living things? Anybody question that? Do plants have hormones? Does anybody think, like, what are you talking about? Testosterone doesn't make sense. Um, the more and more people I've interacted with some people don't see plants as living they don't see them as needing food they don't see them as needing water they don't see them as needing anything they're just objects that are positioned in place they're bought just as universal bought you know these trees for a hundred thousand dollars a piece and they just prop them and they just exist but um but plants were here well before us and i've got in our powerpoint presentation that um I'll share with you that the earth was developed like 4.5 billion years ago. The first plants existed, we're talking about single cell organisms that can make oxygen about 3.5 billion years ago. And then it wasn't until about 300 million years ago, so not billion, but now million, that these trees existed. The, um, the conifer trees. And then it was only 100 million years. And just to let you know, the conifers and those species are only about a thousand. And some say it's two and some say it's three. But, and then, and that includes also sago palm trees are related to pine trees as they have cones, unlike flowers and fruits that actually have encapsulated <laughs> seeds. Um, and those are the angiosperms. Um, and the angiosperms only existed on earth about a hundred million years ago still way before mammals, let's just say. Um, so it was 100 million years ago that we then have the angiosperms, which include the citrus and the flowers and um, a lot of other um, things. But the point being with the 100 million years ago, as of that date until now, there's over 200,000 species compared to the 5,000 in this family that existed 300 million years ago. So even though it's older, there's fewer species than there are that are newer and more diverse. Um, when it comes to plant hormones, and the reason I wanted to bring plants to life, so to speak, um, is for one, one hormone that exists in plants is something called auxins. And auxins are usually um, formed at the plant's tips. So when you go and you prune the top of the plant off, you'll notice quickly that at the leaves and the joints, they'll all now sprout with more branches and more leaves. Um, the logic behind it is there's auxins at the top, which are concentrated, even though it's throughout, but it's more so near the plant tips is where it's manufactured. Near the bottom are the cytokinins, which are another plant hormone that's manufactured by the roots. Cytokinins are again all over the plant, but again, the concentration is lower at the bottom half and auxins more at the top half. When you remove the top half, you've just removed the top half of auxins, now causing these cytokinins to now increase its balance within its plant and forces the plant shoots and branches to happen at each of the leaf nodes. These leaf nodes will not branch into additional branches because these auxins are drowning the effects of the cytokinins. Those are two hormones. A third very important one also keep in mind is ethylene gas. And ethylene gas is what for example, with the tomatoes you pick up at your um, grocery store, they're usually picked green. A lot of these places will pick them green because if they pick them red and then ship them while they're bouncing, you know, and there's thousands of pounds on top of one another, they'll crush each other. So they usually pick them green and then they'll put them in chambers with ethylene gas, which is a natural gas that plants make, but there's a manufactured ethylene gas that's added and quickly turns those green tomatoes red. And that's the reason you're picking up, you know, these tomatoes that are firm and they're not natural. And, um, but that's another gas that's also naturally made by plants. But I just wanted to share with you three plant hormones to, again, help bring plants to life and let you know that there is a balance of chemicals and hormones and immunity that's happening within your plants. Um, 
One other thing I want to add now. Um, when it comes to plant nutrition, what are the three things that plants need? The three major macronutrients as it's known in the plant world. Water, carbon dioxide. Nutrients. Nitrogen is one. There's two more. Phosphorus. And one last one. And potassium. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Nitrogen primarily for growth, phosphorus for fruit production and flowering, and then the potassium is more so for disease resistance and roots. So you've got these three macronutrients. Uh, in the human world, we're not going to say mammals, I'm going to try to keep it more simple. In the human world, what are our three macronutrients? Any guesses? Protein. Protein's one. Come on, my favorite, fat. And one more, and carbohydrates. So those are your three macronutrients. So um, you can get all of those macronutrients from simply going to McDonald's and get your Big Mac, your fries, and a drink, and you'll have protein, your carbohydrates, and your fat. So you'll get all of it in a Big Mac meal. My point being is when you go to pick a fertilizer, you can pick miracle Grow, and I'm not slamming miracle Grow because miracle Grow also does um, organic lines as well, but this here is a chemical option, and I'd like to say, like, if you're buying something that's like fluorescent blue and put it, putting it on your plant, you're adding nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It would be the equivalent of adding McDonald's to your tree. On the contrary, Using something like this, which is an organic fertilizer, which now has feathers and blood and bones and seaweed and all these other things to add the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, you've now gained them from healthier choices to help create a more stable and healthier plant. Yes, Mike? What's blood meal? It's actually animal blood. I think it actually comes from cattle. Like, I think it's part of the process of when they process the meat. Oh, the nitrogen. There's nitrogen in blood. I know you think like iron and other things, but it's nitrogen that's being offered from blood. If you actually just put blood meal on your plants, you're offering your plant a lot of nitrogen. Um, if you put bone meal on your plants, you're offering your plant a lot of phosphorus to help with fruit production and flowers. And then for potassium, it's usually like wood ash. You can take wood ash out of your fireplace and put that on your plant and get the phosphorus. So those are your three macronutrients. The other value when putting these things in your soil is when you're feeding your plants, you're actually wanting to feed the soil. And by feeding your soil, you create a biology within the ground that'll result in a healthier plant. If you put miracle Grow, this is not going to feed your earthworms in your soil. They're probably going to hate it and probably scatter and get away from your plant. Um, there's also nematodes, beneficial bacteria and fungus that are also in your soil, even if you don't see it. So those mushrooms that you see popping around your garden once in a while, those roots can travel up to a thousand feet. So when you see an oak tree at the top of the hill and you're wondering how is this thing surviving, one way is beneficial, um, it's a symbiotic relationship between the plant's roots, which could be maybe 100 feet, intertwined with these mushrooms or mycorrhizal fungi that actually now expand another 1,000 feet and attach to a water source, bringing the water to the plant in exchange for the sugars that the plant's making for the fungus, because the fungus is underground, so it's depending upon the plant. Um, so that's one way that plants can get their water. So it's through beneficial <coughs> fungus in the ground. And the second is um, the redwood trees. The example I like to use is the redwood trees up in Northern California. Um, they're three to 400 feet tall. And there was some research that was done on how, did, how does the plant possibly get all that water to the top of the plant? Any ideas? Some of those redwood trees actually absorb it from the air on the coast. That's the answer. The trees can absorb as much as 25 to 50 percent of its water from the air. And we actually have the same, not the same, a similar climate on some mornings where it's like foggy and you can see that everything's dewy and wet. The tree's sucking all of that moisture up and can actually get most of its water from the air. Um, so as we get into the native plant discussion um, and you're wondering like how's my plant going to survive without water, it 
is native to here. So it knows once it's established, it'll get a balance of moisture from the soil. It'll also get a lot of it from just the air. The California climate, we're on the coastal side of this side of the mountains. We're gaining all of the um, ocean fog that's coming in in the mornings, even throughout the summer, and that's watering your plants, even without irrigation. Um, so those are all things to consider. Um, one last thing I want to add before I jump into the PowerPoint is fruit. Why do your plants fruit, regardless of what it is? Let's say it's an apple. Um, why does your apple tree form apples? Aside from us to eat, what's the evolutionary idea behind that? But why is it doing it? It's tempting seeds. the animals to eat the fruit so that they deposit it. Yeah. She, she got it. Birds yeah. and seeds. Every fruit, I got bananas in my backyard, I got a lot of citrus in my backyard, I've got apples, I got avocados. Avocados are tricky, like what kind of animal is going to eat that and disperse it? Figs, easily, tons of birds, raccoons, squirrels. Um, nature got most of my figs this year. Um, but the point being, the tree evolutionarily creates these fruits to offer them to the wild. And the wild is supposed to take these fruits, consume them, and pass its genetics off. And that's why the tree is trying its best to be the sweetest and the kindest. I'm just kidding. Um, but the point is, the tree is doing its best to basically pa pass off its genetics to the next generation. The way it does it is through its fruit. Um, so keep that in mind. I mean, and that's another inspiration when I'm in the garden is to like watch, you know, the flowering and the, and, and it's like, what's the reason why and what's happening and who's benefiting from it. And you'll actually see the biology as long as you don't put half of these poisons that are behind me in your garden. Um, and we'll get to that in the middle of this presentation. Um, so we're going to flip just to let you know, the three discussions we're going to have real quick, are we going to talk about native plants? Our last summer discussion by show of hand, how many of you were there in the summer? So only about 30%. Um, so our summer garden class, we had a, a special guest speaker from the Theodore Payne Foundation, Lisa Novak, who um, inspired a lot of us about the importance of actually introducing California native species into your garden. Um, and the reason I say California is because we're here in California. If you lived in Arizona, then you'd be looking for Arizona specific plants for your garden. If you lived in Hong Kong, you'd be looking for Hong Kong native plants to introduce into your garden. Um, but for us, the focus is California, and more specifically, if you can find plants that are native to Southern California, you'll be doing an immense contribution to your surrounding ecosystem and wildlife that's out there. Um, for the last few years, my neighbor and I have been working really hard on preserving monarch butterflies. Um, and we've started off with, you know, growing the milkweeds, sharing them at pretty much every single garden class meeting where I've now seen it at almost every other house that I visit. Um, and I know with a couple of us, including myself, and I've been trying to control the seeds, um, we unfortunately planted what's called a tropical milkweed, which is native to Mexico. So we're talking about the importance of growing California native plants, and now here we are bringing a milkweed, and there's a lot of California varieties that we could have planted, but we brought a tropical one, which is the number one milkweed variety you'll find in your nursery. So if you're looking to buy milkweed so you can support the monarch butterflies, 99% of them are only selling tropical milkweed. And the reason being is it stays green through the winter. California milkweed dies in the winter and comes back in the spring. It's still considered a perennial plant, meaning it lives year after year after year, but it will look dead to the average gardener. They'll say it's gone, it's dead, and plant something else in its place. Um, when in fact it's still there, or other gardeners will return the plant saying it died on me. Hence, the nurseries don't want to carry it. Um, what I've done is I've started a collection of seedlings over there a couple of months ago, which are going to be, everybody should be leaving with some. There's about five or six milkweeds in the mix. There's golden yarrow, there's California poppies, and the fourth that I brought were some California specific sunflowers. So it's not the giant sunflowers but those more bushy, compact, covered in dense yellow flowers type of sunflower. So those are four varieties of seedlings we're giving away. We're gonna give away also some California poppy seeds, and we're gonna talk about how to plant those as well. So California native, the second thing we're gonna talk about is poison and different levels of ways to control both insects as well as rodents on your property. And the last thing we're gonna do is talking about um, potting 
and I've got next to me a, um, a Meyer lemon tree. And I'm also going to show the importance of having a lemon in your garden. Um, if we turn the page where it says get, get connected, The first thing I want to say is um, to get connected to the Hollywood Knowles. I got an email in the last week from a resident that says I want to join. Um, to join, it's as easy as just emailing hollywoodknowles at yahoo.com. If you haven't done it yet, do it and let them know where you live and you'll be included on what is controlled by the Hollywood Knowles board. It's decisions that are made by the board and things that the board wants you to know. But the second thing I got on the list is called nextdoor.com. You put in your zip code and your address and it'll actually identify you as the Hollywood Hills East and I believe there's about 300 members, maybe 250 that are there right now. It's been growing quite rapidly, but it's a way for you yourself to hop on the internet and talk to your neighbors immediately um, and get responses. Um, some issues being, you know, helicopter noise sometimes, like what's going on? Or if there's too many, you know, ambulances in the area, what's happening? And you'll sometimes get answers within minutes. It's an amazing tool. Um, and if you're not connected, um, I just highly recommend it. And even our board has actually emailed all of you to get connected because it's another way of getting the news in your community. For quotes, here's a few things I want to share with you. The best place to get ideas and inspiration for your own garden is by visiting other gardens. I said that already and that's why we're here and I'm hoping we'll have a new house to go to in the winter. If you want to be happy for a lifetime, be a gardener. And this isn't my quote, gardening is cheaper than therapy and you get tomatoes. I took that from someone else as well. And the last one I came up with, Gardening is a science with more than one way to get fruitful results. The point with that being is whatever I say will hopefully inspire you in a way that will take you on your own path. Um, my way is not the only way. Um, there's other people like this year I grew eight different varieties of tomatoes. Did a video on that and removed one just because for the first time ever I had tomato end rot which is a calcium deficiency within the soil that causes it. And the tomato just before it ripened just got really soft and it was blended green and red. It just didn't ripen right. Remove the whole plant with like 50 tomatoes on it. I'm like, it's not even something I'd want to eat or give away to anybody. Threw it away. Within a week, I got a comment from someone that saw the tomato plant and said, of all of the tomato plants she's ever grown, this is in New Jersey, she's like, that's my favorite variety for making, you know, sauces and cooking with and whatever else. And I'm like, well, because of you, I'll plant two more next year. And the reason is, it was probably just a fluke. I mean, what's the chances that every single seed is going to give you an amazing result? You can plant eight identical tomatoes and get eight different results um, in regards to production, height, and, and quality. So you can't rely on just one and make a decision off of it. So, and that was the San Marzano tomato variety, if any of you know that. Um, fall equinox. We're now in the first week of fall. The first day of fall was September 22nd. Today is the 24th. And tomorrow is actually the first day with as close as possible to 12 hours of daylight. So there's a little bit more than 12 hours of daylight today and yesterday had a little bit more than today. And tomorrow will be falling to 12 hours and then the day after that it's going to be like 11 hours and 59 minutes and going down fast to the point by December 21st there will only be 9 hours and 53 minutes of daylight. So your days will be that short. And I just think it's interesting, and I don't know if you guys spend enough time in the garden like I do, where you actually see the amount of light and the impact of the difference between summer light and winter light in your garden and, and your growing zones that you have and where your sunny areas in your garden. But um, I know for me, I'm usually bummed between now and January or February until I start getting the hope where the light returns to a, lot of part, you know, a, lot of, a large part of my garden. Um, for garden tips, I wrote in Los Angeles, um, your chance of freezing living here is only in the last week of December through the second week of January, which is unheard of for like the rest of the country. Um, unless you live in Hawaii, it would maybe be the exception. But you only have a three week chance of frost damaging anything you do in your garden. So I recommend, and I usually start my tomatoes sometime like in February and early March at the latest. Um, I've planted some tomatoes at different times throughout the year just to see how they perform and the result is you end up with a plant that's usually not as tall, not as fruitful, not as, you know, it just won't reach its maximal potential if you don't start at the beginning of the season because by now, which is now September and then going into October, the plant will now um, typically get plagued by disease, 
wilt, and a whole bunch of other um, issues that'll actually take its life away. Um, in just the shorter light hours, it, it, it causes the plant to slow down. Production also dies down as well. So consider planting as early as the third week of January when you start your spring garden. And then I wrote over here a quick slide talking about which vegetables grow best in fall. And I'm just gonna skip over that, but for any of you looking for things to add in your garden, there's a list of about a dozen choices. And then here we go. California native versus drought tolerant plants. And I wrote a list here of plants that we know in our community. Aloe vera, um, native to Africa, Madagascar, and Jordan. Um, agave, no, native to Southwest USA, Mexico, and South America. Dragon fruit, um, cactus, Central and South America. Oleander, which we've got a lot growing naturally in our community. Morocco, Portugal, and China. Um, jacarandas, you'll see a few you know, on some yards. Central and South America, Jamaica, and Bahamas. The camphor trees are very common in our community. Um, that's native to China, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. The ficus, Asia and Australia. And then citrus, Australia and Southeast China. Um, the reason I did this slide again is to, um, is to bring attention to the fact that a lot of the plants that we have around us are not from here. We're bringing them because we like the way they look, we like the way they appear. They may be drought tolerant, but they're not California native plants. And we're gonna talk about the importance of that in just a minute. The California native plants on this next slide are, and I just mentioned are California poppies, golden yarrow, sunflower, and milkweed. Those four I've actually got as the plant giveaways later on today. But other plants I have are sage, um, which I'm gonna pass around here. This one over here is a, a black sage, if you wanna share this, so you can actually see what that looks like. The other sage I have here as well is called um, blue sage. It's an Allen Chickering variety. The, unfortunately this plant got beat up in the sun, um, but after we passed it around, if anybody wants to try to grow it, I've successfully grown these from cuttings. Um, and this here is called a Bowman's California Fuchsia. Um, attractant for hummingbirds and bees um, and so forth and other insects. But you can see it's a beautiful flower. It's a nice compact plant. Uh, another one that I love but I don't have as an example is woolly blue curls. The most beautiful blue flowers covering the entire plant and it typically grows as a shrub. Beautiful contrast. And then buckwheat. It comes in all different colors and as you can see yellow, red, pink and white. Since we just mentioned milkweed as a plant, and I told you I'm bringing the um, Asclepius is the genus, and the species name is Aerocarpa. On the next slide, for those of us that actually have the tropical milkweed, I wanted to put it in writing on what to do and how to care for it. Um, <clears throat> but the Asclepius, here it goes. So milkweed, AKA, AKA Asclepius is the genus name. Speciosa fascularis, California, and the Aerocarpa are four varieties are that are California native milkweeds that you can, um, and that are preferred to bring into your garden. If you're growing Asclepius curasavacchia, which is tropical milkweed native to Mexico, then I've made notes here to cut it down six inches, down to six inches off the ground by December. And each year in December to control what's called the OE spore. And it's basically a, um, a spore that is carried by the monarch butterfly adult that lands on the plant, licks on the flowers, lays its egg, but the spores from its body just landed now on the plant. The caterpillar that emerges from its egg then eats the leaf that now has spores on it. The spores now go into the body of the caterpillar. It turns into a chrysalis. Um, my neighbor here knows how to identify while it's in the chrysalis that something's happening that's wrong because the spores will actually start turning black and if not one spot, the entire chrysalis will start turning black from these spores. Um, that'll then either turn this, that'll either turn this um, monarch butterfly into a deformed monarch butterfly. It might kill it before it comes out. And then some of them are, may appear healthy enough to travel to the next plant to get its spores on the next plant and repeat the damage. Um, the reason tropical milkweed is bad is because it never dies down, allowing the, milk, the spore cycle to end. Um, so by having tropical milkweed, if you don't cut it down, the spores will continue living throughout year after year after year, and each caterpillar that lands on that plant will get infected by that OE spore 
and and affect its chances of continuing its migration down to Mexico or up to Canada, wherever it's going. Yes. How long do the spores last in the, you know, when they come to the ground? The logic behind it is once it's off the plant, once it's cut down, even down to six inches, what's going to happen is by February, March, the plant's going to emerge with new leaves and the spores, whatever it may occur, will be down in the ground and inactivated. So it'll, it'll, be, it'll be gone. But if you leave your plant large, it's only going to grow a few inches per year because now it's reached its maximum height and the spores are going to be all around the plant. But the goal is by cutting it down, you're going to get a whole new flush of new growth that'll grow. On average, these plants grow about two to three feet. So that's what you're dealing with in regards to the size of the bush. Any other questions in regards to milkweed? Yes. The original ones that we would use to distribute to us and everything in group were the wrong ones, right? Correct. So I took them out. Yeah. I, so my, Mike said he's removed most of his milkweed in his garden. It's the right thing to do. I've left mine just because I've got so many, but what I've been doing is, and here it is, this is the plant. Um, what I've been doing is actually removing these seed pods. And I know when my neighbor looked at the plant, she's like, where's all the seeds? And I, you also drove by the other day. Um, I've been actually removing these seed pods as often as I see them. Like I looked in the front yard trying to find one, I couldn't find one. I had to go to the backyard to find this so you can see what the seed pod looks like. These are the color of the flowers. There's some aphids on it. Um, and I'm gonna pass this around. There's a slide that talks about um, aphids as well. When you're actually growing native plants, you do not use any pest control. You do not use any fertilizer. Um, and your water, you're saving a ton of water compared to other plants. Um, but with the aphids that are on there, <clears throat> my point being is it's part of the biology and part of the natural life cycle within your garden. I try to envision those aphids as being the bunnies and the, you know, and the antelope that are running through the savanna. And then I've got my praying mantis lion and I've got my cheetah ladybug and, and they're keeping those populations in check. If I wipe all of those aphids off the plants, I'm now starving the praying mantis, starving the ladybugs, and they're just gonna leave. And I think there's no better garden than mine for those predators and prey to be. So I keep them all. And I'm hoping that you guys think the same way. And it's not unless, and that plant was healthy before it burned in the sun. Um, it's not the aphids that did it, but if your plant's actually stressed and it looks like it's wilting and it's not performing and it needs help, we're gonna talk about things you can do that are least damaging and when you treat the plant, you treat specifically the plant, not your entire garden, and, and try to mess up the entire biology of what's going on. I just read something about cutting, like you'll see a really infested area, just cut it off and throw it about five feet away from the plant. So you're feeding everything, but the plant is strong. That's a good idea too. So she just mentioned if there's any infestation within your garden, you can actually cut it off. Most of the readings I said is, dispose of it in your black trash bin and make sure it doesn't mix or get contaminated. But she said you can actually throw it off in another part of your garden to make sure that those, the prey is still available to the predators in your garden. And at least it'll then cause the plant that's been pruned to recreate new growth and hopefully, you know, under the supervision of more predators, hopefully less um, past the second round. Um, but that would be, that would be the I think the highest level and the best way to actually treat your plant before resorting to some of these organic um, solutions. It's kind of like feeding the bears in your cemetery. <laughs> with people, right? <laughs> if you throw that in your compost and then you use the compost so all those yellow later on, are it comes back. So, um, so you ask if you can actually put it in your compost bin. The, um, as long as it's just aphids, no problem. But the risk is, I know some people actually, have, and towards the end of the year, I'm very selective on what goes in the compost and what doesn't. Uh, my tomatoes typically towards the end of the year will be covered in um, like white, it could be white flies, it could be um, uh, like a mildew. Um, and it's actually, it's, it's, another, it's another disease that actually um, spreads. Um, I know on my squash plants towards the end of the year, they're all covered in, 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 in that mildew, um, fungus, white flies, a whole bunch of diseases that you don't want to recycle back into the compost. So you got to make a decision on some of these diseased plants to just put them in your maybe green bin and have you know the green trash decide what to do with it. But I wouldn't put it back in your garden. But if it's minor, sure you can recycle it. Um, Should I 
Charles, I had mine, you know, just covered with aphids. You could hardly see the stems. There was aphids all over it. And then one day they're all gone. Where'd they go? I mean, it's like, I didn't have any, um, I don't think I had predators. They could be, um, so she said one day the aphids all disappeared, you know, on, on its own and maybe it wasn't a predator. It could have been anything. It could have been the cycle ended. It could have been the temperature change. Um, one thing that's a big deal right now, and I know a couple people in our community that's doing this. Here's a couple of citrus, um, and I don't know how many of you here have citrus. If I can get a show of hands. So about fifth, more than 50% of you. Um, but some gardens, including mine, I spray organically my plants almost every two to three weeks starting from May to June through like another two more weeks, so probably the end of September, first week of October, to protect against what's called, and I'm trying to see if I can find a leaf, but these just came out of the nursery recently, um, but to protect against what's called citrus leaf minor. It's basically um, like a white fly slash uh, moth that actually lives somewhere between the soil part of its life cycle, and then the other part of the life cycle is up in the plant, and then when it lays its eggs on the leaf, the caterpillar actually works its way in between the leaf and then tunnels zigzag back and forth across the leaf and eventually causes the leaf to curl. Um, it typically doesn't affect the health of the plant, but it definitely affects the appearance of the plant. They could affect the health of the plant if they're young like these. And then once they're established as they are in most of your yards, you can just let it go and then just cut it off um, and hopefully get a better growth that comes out in October, November. Um, so those are just a couple of options. but. Um, for my citrus trees, I do treat them differently than everything else in my garden. I specifically treat each plant individually and not the avocados and not the bananas and not everything else in my garden, just so that the leaves do present well as I get guests in my backyard. Otherwise, all the leaves would actually curl by what's called the citrus leaf one. What do you use to spray them? I'm going to share with you in just a minute. Okay. What do you ever use, Melify? No way. No way. No way. So I've got a list over here, California native trees. And I wrote Descanso Gardens and I gave you the address. Everything that you see on this list are at the Descanso Gardens so you can actually see the tree and, and consider what would be a California native plant. I wrote lemonberry for you, California lilac, which bloom blue and purple flowers, woolly leaf manzanita is on my list, which also forms white flowers and has a very attractive bark. The California buckeye with white and pink flowers, the California scrub oak, which is an oak tree that only grows three to six feet tall. The coast live oak, which can grow as tall as 30 to 80 feet and live as much as 250 years. And then the California sycamore. And then the important question, why grow California natives? And I've listed them here and I think I pretty much covered them all. Um, for one, they're drought tolerant and low water requirement. And a lot of people have taken the California natives and instead just did a lot of succulents and cactus in their gardens to take advantage of the drought tolerant low water. But planting California natives is taking it to another level. You're actually going to end up using also the same amount if not less water than planting succulents in your garden. And we're going to get to one of the points down below, you're going to be supporting the local habitat and wildlife. The California natives are also colorful and beautiful. Unfortunately I didn't have more examples to show you, but you saw the milkweed flower. Um, and it comes in a variety of colors from white to orange to, you saw the, the, the red and orange flower that I passed around, which is the wrong variety um, to be planting. So milkweed, the fuchsia is beautiful. Um, the um, buckwheat is another and a variety of colors. I've got one that's blooming right now with yellow flowers. Um, I've got another variety that's blooming with pink flowers. I didn't pick them just because I want the seeds to create the next generation that I'll share with you guys, hopefully at the future garden classes. Um, it's also for erosion control. You also use no pesticides. We all know why no pesticides on your California natives. I'm gonna have one of you guys answer. Why no pesticides? Because it's, it's a native. Um, it's a native plant. Um, they don't need it. And you don't need it. Um, and then the no fertilizer. Again, they're native to here, so they know how to grow with the nutrients that are naturally in your soil. Um, but the no pesticides kind of piggybacks on this next point, which is to support your local habitat and wildlife, which includes the bees, the butterflies, the ladybugs, the praying mantis, and I circled and highlighted the aphids too. Um, earthworms, your hawks, your P22, mountain lion, 
and beyond. It's basically your entire food chain is being supported by just putting some California native plants in your backyard and your front yard. And I'm just starting that process this year and trying to find areas between my lemon trees and between my avocado trees that have enough sun that'll support these California native plants. Additionally, it will maximize the efficiency within your garden. And the point being is you're now gonna attract the pollinators that are naturally in your area. Um, the honeybees are one, but there might be other bees that are also native to our area. I haven't done my research on this, but I know they exist. That'll be drawn specifically to your California native plants. That'll go from that plant to your lemon tree, for example, or to your apple tree and to your other plants that you want them to be pollinated. So you're gonna, when I say maximize the efficiency, you're gonna get more pollinators within your garden by planting California native plants in your garden to benefit and increase your fruit yields through, throughout. Yes. Two of them are the mason bee and the leaf cutter bee. So there we go. A lot of people, when they have the citrus, the leaf cutter makes its nest out of that. And they make these little cookie cutter round circles. And so a lot of people think, oh my God, I've got something eating my plant. And they go out and they start spraying. And then they kill off all of it. So I want to make sure you all heard that. It's called the cookie cutter? No, it's, it's called the leaf cutter bee. Leaf cutter bee, and the other one was? And the mason bee. So that's two more bees that should be in your garden, aside from... Yeah, I've seen some that are like maybe one third or one fifth the size of a, of a honeybee. And they're doing the same thing, pollinating within those flowers. Um, yes? Maybe a dumb question, but you know, we live in the hills, and of course there's all the pressure around. Is all the pressure in the hills California natives? Um, so I've done research on this. I don't know for sure, but I know that they say a lot of the natural landscape, like I know, for example, I did research on Hawaii. When you actually go on the trails and you take a look at all that tropical landscape and it looks so beautiful, over 90% of that landscape that you see in Hawaii that looks so beautiful and lush is not native to Hawaii. So I'm pretty sure a lot of what's in our hill is also, I'm probably going to be contributing with that tropical milkweed that's now going to be you know, spreading. Um, and it's going to be hard to now undo that, but, um, but a lot of that is just people bringing plants from their gardens and some of them just take over invasively. Another huge one is um, the Argentinian pompous grass. I don't know if you see those, but I know that's a major issue around the lake. It actually um, takes away from habitat and nature and it really messes up the biology and ecology um, around Lake Hollywood. And if you take a look at, around the rim, there's like a perfect line and rows of pompous grass, the Argentinian pompous grass, which has really sharp blades that can grow anywhere from four to 10 feet tall. And it's a severe fire hazard as well. Um, and very hard to get rid of. You can cut it down to the ground, it'll come right back. It, it's, it's hard to remove those roots. Um, another point here is for pollination, decomposition. Um, I wrote this as well for those that do compost piles and I do compost piles also between my trees. If you're actually putting chemicals and stuff, you're actually killing the biology that's allowing these things to happen naturally. Um, evolution and history of plants we already talked about. The earth, 4.5 billion, single plants. Single, um, single cell plants 3.5 billion years ago. The gymnosperms, which are the, um, your pine trees and your um, cycads, which are the sago palms and, um, and those varieties. Also ginkgo biloba, I know there's a plant um, here as well that's a ginkgo. Um, those all evolved about 3 million years ago. Your angiosperms about 100 million years ago, which are like the majority of the plants, as, as we wrote down below, about 200 species compared to only one to five thousand of the gymnosperms that evolved three million years ago. And then how to get started. That was part of our presentation. We left our last garden meeting with, we want it, and I've helped a couple people doing research, and it's like, how do we get started? Theodore Payne said, just come over to our nursery and you can buy it there, but I didn't want to leave you with just one option and one choice for um, making a decision. But I gave you the address for Theodore Payne Foundation, which is located in Sun Valley, so it's, it's about 10 minutes from here. I gave you two other addresses, Green Thumb Nursery, the one in Lake Forest, I actually picked up about a handful of California natives there, but it was less than 2% of their grounds had a designated area for California natives. Um, if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, chances are you won't find any at all. Um, so the reason I put the numbers there for you is so you can call before you go to any of these nurseries. And then I also gave you online where you can actually search for the keyword California and then purchase some more California native seeds. As the time for be planting your seeds is actually between now and like January. February might, be, might even be too late. So um, with the seeds I'm giving you today, 
I'm giving that to you as a start. I'll for sure have more plants, more California natives to give you in January, which I'm working on. Um, so and that was my last point. Don't miss their garden club meetings because for those of you that come all the time, you know that I try to give as much as I can. So, um, so be on the lookout for that. And my goal right now is to get as many more milkweeds into your properties that are the right varieties. Um, California poppy seeds. When I give you those seeds, um, select at least three sunny locations. As we said, um, gardening is a science and you might plant it there and that's where all your slugs and your, you, no matter what you do, it's just not gonna work or the water isn't right. So I said, find three different um, sunny locations in your garden that are free of wood chips and rocks and gravel. Scratch the soil about a quarter inch, add some seeds and scratch the seeds into the soil. Um, again, keep it within the top quarter inch and water carefully. Make sure the top quarter inch to ha top half inch of soil remains moist. And we're talking about one to two waterings a week for under 30 seconds. The goal is just to keep that top, top soil moist long enough for those plants to germinate. Sprinkle some organic um, snail bait and slug bait, which I'm giving you. Um, so I wrote snail and, and bug bait. The product I'm giving you is based on two things. One of them is a um, spinosad, which is um, a way of actually controlling biologically the insects using a bacteria. So the, um, whether it's a, I wrote snail, snail's one, but if it's also a um, roly-poly, what's another word for roly-poly? Saw, saw bug. Um, or pillow bug, pincher bug, or the earwigs, um, I know there's another name for them. All of those will actually damage your seedlings um, at the beginning. So with the amount I'm giving you, it's just about a teaspoon amount or a tablespoon, you're just gonna sprinkle it around your zone. The goal is I'm protecting this area long enough for it to happen. Within a couple of weeks, the effectiveness of the product I'm giving you is gonna be gone but it'll hopefully just give the plants a chance long enough to grow that if it gets chewed on a little bit, it doesn't kill the plant. Um, so that's what we're using it for. And also with your gardening needs, do it the same way. Only treat the area that needs protection and don't spray and contaminate your entire garden. Um, sprinkle some organic snail and bug bait in and around the seeded area to ensure that the sprouts do not get consumed. And it's not an issue once the plant gets established. The California native seedlings, so I've got the baby plants that are in those cups along the fence. Um, you're gonna find a sunny place in your garden, loosen the soil up to the length and the width of the cup. Insert the plant carefully not to disturb the roots as little as possible. Add some small wood chips or leaf mold around the plant, but leave about a half inch space between the plant and the plant stem, as you don't want any insects that are consuming the wood to get confused with the leaf mold and the wood chips to then start eating the plant. The same thing applies with all of your trees. If you've got wood chips around your trees, keep a space between the wood chips and the tree trunk for the same reason, so that as the wood chips are decaying and enriching the soil and also offering the moisture, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't bring those same insects or uh, also contribute to what's called stem rot when those wood chips and um, any organic matter comes too close in contact with the plant. Um, scatter, I wrote organic snail and bug bait in an inch wide ring around the plant to form a barrier about one inch away from the stem. Water carefully and thoroughly about one cup of water two to three times per week for the first couple of weeks and two cups and then one cup a week and then it should be winter, I wrote. Um, any questions on California natives? I have one more question. Yes. Okay. What is your opinion on bringing native plants from say northern California in the altitudes down to the coastal areas in California? So the question being, what if we brought plants from Northern California down to Southern California or vice versa, right? Like the wildflowers, they, there's a, a milkweed up there. That grows up there. called the showy milkweed. You're right, you're right, you're right. Property, and it's huge and it's beautiful. And the monarchs and the swallowtails, they come after. You're right. When it comes to milkweed, if you actually um, even just Google California milkweed varieties, it'll actually break down the varieties. And even the ones on my list, it might say it's more concentrated in Southern California. California. Fornica, I believe, spans the entire state of California. Um, the showy milkweed, I've got to look at the chart, but you're saying it's northern California. And if you brought it down, um, what effect would it have? I know that most of the research when it surrounds milkweed specifically, they just want to make sure it dies down in the winter. Like that's the key. If, as long as it disappears for at least a month or two before it comes back. Well, I don't know what it would do down here. It disappears up north because it's colder, and over here it's probably too warm and might, it might exist. Um, 
in my opinion, since you're asking me, I would think it's a lot less damaging than planting tropical milkweed. Um, so if I were to pick one or the other, I mean, I think that would be a, a safe solution. And if you know it performs well, and keep this in mind, I'm not saying that you're exclusively planting only California natives in your garden because none of us have that. And I'm not going to give up my avocados and my, um, my citrus that come from Australia and my Meyer lemon that comes from China and my, you know, all of my favorite things, pomegranates that maybe come from the Middle East. But, um, but the point is you got plants that you want, but leave some room for the California native stuff and you'll be making a difference and adding value to the community. Um, so that's the lesson with this and that's what all of us are going to leave with and take back to our gardens after this meeting with the plants and the seeds and everything else and we're going to keep doing this as part of every single garden class going forward. Um, except I won't be talking this much about California natives. This is my, we got a taste of it last time. It's my introduction and, and, and my, um, you know, contribution as well as your garden club and, and it'll just be a small piece of the future lessons is just to Pick up a plant, take it to your garden, and, and, and do your part within the community. Um, and if you see anything else you'd like to share or do, that's why I've got my surveys. Give me notes, give me some ideas, tell me what you want me to do, and you'll probably see it happen. Any other questions on this? Yes. Yeah. I have a quick question. Maybe uh, this Reggie, but you said if you come to the top, no branches will come out below. Yeah. I thought the idea of cutting the top. So the question was, if I cut the top of it off, then it won't make the branches? Right. So it's just the opposite. What's happening is the top of this is making the hormone called auxin. The auxins actually pour down the stems of the plants down towards the roots. The roots are making a hormone called cytokinin, which are pouring up the plant and working its way up towards the shoots. The auxins encourage root development the cytokinins in the root are encouraging shoot and branch development. So by removing the top, I've just removed the auxin out of the equation, and now the cytokinin hormones are the dominant hormone within the plant that's just encouraging shoot production. So that means every leaf now is going to branch and try to form new shoots, and then as those shoots develop, those will create the auxins to tell the lower shoots, don't waste your time, I'm taking over here and those will create the new branches. And that's why you'll usually see if I cut here, these top two leaves will become the new branches. And the lower I go, that's where you're gonna control the branches. And then with that idea in mind, you can now shape plants. Even though this Meyer lemon typically, it's a naturally dwarf tree, even on standard rootstock, typically growing about 10, maybe 12 feet at the maximum. Whereas a standard lemon tree, any other varieties will typically go 20 to 30 feet. So two to three times taller than this. Um, the point being that you can control the height, you can manage the, a 10 foot tall Meyer lemon tree and keep it down to six feet quite easily by pruning it. And I'm just sharing with you the value of actually knowing what's going on at the hormonal level within the plant. Yes. Oh, so time to prune and time not to prune. Um, It's not time to prune. For those of you that have, bless you, for those of you that have deciduous plants, meaning the leaves are going to fall in the fall or even winter. Uh, so let's imagine this plant is going to drop its leaves and now I'm going to prune it. If you were to prune it, the best time to actually prune it is either after the leaves have fallen, but in my opinion, the best time to prune is right before it goes into flush and before it grows. Uh, I actually prune my plants throughout the spring and summer and fall. I'm always pruning. If I see something that's going in the wrong direction, I'll cut it and I'll shape it. I have an apple tree, um, for example, and I did a video on this where I've got a three-in-one apple tree and I've grafted it. And one day you guys will come to my garden, you'll see this thing. Um, but I've got on one branch a Granny Smith. On one of them, I grew a red apple. And on the third branch, which my neighbor and I share, it's one of my elementary school neighbors and mine favorite apple tree. It's a reddish green apple that's sweet and sour. And again, it's half red and half green. Um, and I've never seen it. And it's something that, you know, I've preserved by grafting it to every single apple tree wherever I've lived to this day. Um, so it's made it to like eight homes so far um, over the last 30 years or so. Um, but the goal is I've got my three in one apple tree. What it's offering is they're cross pollinating each other and they're doing what it's doing. But one branch can sometimes dominate 
And it's your decision as you're the artist and you're the scientist in your garden to say, we got to balance this here. And there's no right and wrong time when it comes to pruning growth that happened within the last year and sometimes or two. But you wouldn't prune major branches unless it was, the plant's got to be, I, I like calling it in hibernation. The saps are not flowing, the metabolism's down, you're not fertilizing your plants in the winter, which is one of my last um, PowerPoint slides here. Um, but your goal is you're trying to protect your plant um, and balance it and stabilize the growth and make sure that all the parts are growing the way you want it to. So in regards to pruning, to answer the question, um, my preferable time for pruning is February and March. And I've actually lost plants, and the example being a passion fruit that I pruned in December, January, rather than waiting when the weather was warmer, March, April, to then prune it so that as soon as I cut it, it would go into growth. As again, my backyard, more than 50% of it goes into shade during the winter. So by pruning it, it didn't have the energy to grow. And the prune took away all of those leaves that it was just getting off of light, not sunlight, but just light. So by pruning it, I put it in enough shock that I lost three of my four passion fruits. Um, so I'm now in the process of repropagating those and, and making more. Um, so that's pruning. Yes. Uh, we transplanted a huge established uh, trumpet tree. Yeah, uh, trumpet lily. Uh, it survived, uh, but Betsy, my local advisor, uh, said uh, to leave the dead, the, the branches that did not survive until the winter and then prune what didn't make it. Well, when in the winter? In the winter or in the spring? Well, she just said. They didn't say. Um, general rule again, and I'm looking at citrus, and if you don't know, I'm a huge lover of citrus trees. Um, but when it comes to deadwood, you're always supposed to remove deadwood because it's now an invitation to termites and beetles and everything else to now use that wood. And it's sometimes, I don't want to say difficult, maybe the plant knows and, or the bugs are intentionally doing this, but they'll go right into the heart of the tree. The only living part of the tree is if this is the bark, which is the dead outer layer tissues of the skin, like your skin, the bark is on the outside. Right underneath the bark is this green cambium tissues, which carries the waters and the sugars up and down the tree, as well as those hormones that we talked about. Right under the cambium tissue, so if I can curve this now, so here's your trunk. Cambium tissue is like the paper that's in between. And then this whole inner part is wood. Not living, it's just offering support for most trees some might actually have some vascular tissue in there i'm thinking like maybe some palms and stuff might actually because they're fibrous and they're monocots but for most dicots and i don't want to discuss the difference but most trees their living tissue is on the outside right, under, right underneath the bark level so the point is if they're traveling through the dead branches they can work their way right into the heart of the tree and you've seen those situations where the trees come down and the whole center of the tree is hollow and the way they make their their way into it is typically when people are pruning their branches, and I've done videos on this at the Los Angeles Zoo, where there'll be holes all over that pruned branch of the tree. I'm trying to see if there's any pruning that was done five or 10 years ago, because if they're not covered, and I got a product, which I'm not going to talk much about today, but this product, which is Ivory Organics, it's a three-in-one tree guard paint, actually is an organic paint with oils in it that actually repel insects from entering the tree. So you would actually, once you prune the tree, you'd actually seal it with something like this. Um, You'll also notice that I put it on this tree over here. If I spin it, you'll see that it's got a white trunk. And that's there to basically reflect the sunlight. Most of the trees, and citrus trees, they should be grown with a canopy shape to actually create an umbrella that's shading the lower trunk and the lower branches. Until that happens, by doing that, you'll actually prevent the bark from cracking. And you'll notice that the plants now, instead of it struggling for life, will actually put more of its time, energy, and effort towards growth and fruiting and everything else. But you'll see the lemon on the way out. I'm going to share this with you and then I'll pass it around. Um, because of time, I'm going to skip one topic and go to pest control for just a few minutes. Um, and then I'll just keep on answering questions. Um, for safer pest control, I want to talk about insects first. Your first choice for controlling your insects, as Deborah said, is just remove it and keep those pests in your garden to feed some other predators. But another top choice for controlling would be using a product such as neem oil, mineral oil, or a spinosad based product. And I've got a couple of these examples which I'll maybe throw on the table in front. But this here is Captain Jack's. 
um, which is a bacteria-based way of controlling insects in your garden. Um, so this is one product. A another would be using a neem oil. And a third would be using a mineral oil. So these are three ways to organically control insects within your garden. Again, spray your plant only if it needs it. If it's got aphids on it and it looks healthy, leave it. Um, and if it's a California native plant, again, I want to reemphasize, do nothing. Because by spraying it, the other thing too that you're doing is you might see the aphids. Um, I'll pass that over for you. Here we go. Yeah. I have a ton of those in my yard. So when I was at that Tree of Life nursery, I said, what is in my yard that's attracting them? They said citrus. They lay their eggs in the citrus tree. True. So what I'm wondering, I mean, their uh, caterpillars are in the trees. You're right. So I'm wondering if you spray them for the leaf miner, is that going to kill the... Yeah. So the answer is yes. Um, so she just asked if the... So the swallowtails, those yellow butterflies, the giant ones that you see um, going around, they love laying their eggs on citrus trees. And if you are treating your plant for citrus leaf, um, leaf miners, you are messing up their ability to reproduce and continue their life cycle as well. Um, so that will affect that. So again, you guys are the gardeners and you guys are the decision makers in your garden. And I'm just talking about level of bad to worse. And I know like on my tomatoes, I not once used any of those organic products on any of my tomatoes. Um, even though I saw the tomato hornworm on there. Tomato hornworm, just to let you know, is also a moth that comes out at night that pollinates those flowers. Um, and I, at the beginning of the season, did a video again and removed three or four of them and someone immediately replied from another part of the country and said, why not just leave them? And I did and I had no issues. Sure, I lost a couple of leaves here and there, but the biology was natural. Those caterpillars now fed the birds or you know, maybe a couple of them made it into another moth that continued pollinating the tomatoes. It's part of the cycle. If you can embrace the damage and still enjoy and reap the benefits of your garden without using anything, then you're a top gardener. Um, yes? You're talking about the... Oh, the hornworms. Yeah, they can be huge. When they've got that red horn like on the back of them. Yeah. Um, now for repellents. First choice for controlling moles voles, gophers, and rats, um, is castor oil, blood-based products, or a pepper-based product, or sonic spikes. And here are the examples. Um, one being here, Uncle Ian's has got blood in it, and we learned at the beginning that blood has a lot of nitrogen. And what this does is you scatter it all over your soil, water it down, it makes everything in the soil taste bad. And these moles and voles and gophers leave because it just doesn't make anything in that garden now taste good. Um, so that's one product. Another one is castor oil. And castor oil, here's um, Sweeney's gopher and mole repellent, says covers 2,000 square feet with this bag. My entire backyard is only 700 square feet and I've got over 20 fruit trees. Just to give you an idea of what 2,000 square feet can do. Uh, but what this will do is I'll scatter all over my garden, water it down, and if I have any moles and voles and gophers, they'll all go to my neighbor's house. And then now she's got to do something to get them off of her property. But what's that? Yeah, both of these are still organic choices. Um, another one, which is at top of the list, is a repellent such as this, which is a sonic. I didn't, I didn't know. Oh, it's running off the solar. So that's the sonic. I've never heard it. I thought I had a cat in my hat or a mouse. I thought I caught a mouse. Um, I've never heard it. That was um, surprising. So you heard the sound. So you put this in the ground and it says it treats up to 7,500 square feet. So you stick it in the ground and it says you'll now repel them. I've never used it. The drawback that I've researched about this, it says that um, if it gets wet at all, it can actually get within the battery and mess up the system. And then otherwise you're supposed to change these. I think they're D batteries, the largest batteries every four to six months. So that's like another cost. Um, but that's this system. No matter what you choose with these systems in front of me, you're going to have to repeat them anyways because they eventually wash away, and especially with winter right around the corner with that one rain, and if it's heavy enough, it'll all be gone. Um, so we talked about repellent. Those are repellent choices. Now, second choice for insect control. 
yellow jackets um, for controlling, um, again, insects. The first one I wrote is um, yellow jackets is here. Um, I don't know if it, have any of you used this trap or even like those cylinder traps for catching yellow jackets in your garden. The pheromones or whatever it is that they use in here will actually attract these yellow jackets from as far as a mile away. Um, I tried using one three weeks ago. I want to say for the first time, but I used them initially about three, three to four years ago. Um, but one of my girls was in the backyard and it was just like following her around. And my wife is like, get rid of it. So I put this trap up and within an hour I had 30 of them in here. I'm like, that's too extreme. What is the benefit of a yellow jacket in your garden was my next research. Any ideas? Anybody? Other than they want to like... Pollination. Pollination is one. But there's a bigger actually value of these guys in your garden. They're predators. Yeah. They're predators. These guys eat your caterpillars. Maybe that's why we're not finding as many um, monarchs this year. Um, our monarch caterpillars are our milkweed. But these guys will eat the caterpillars. They'll eat the flies in your garden. And another, um, there's another important um, part of their diet are beetles, small beetles and beetle larvae. So these things are part of your biology in your backyard. So consider keeping them. And I want to give you an alternative to using something like this by doing something like this. And I'm not going to take the time to assemble it, but I'm hoping you can get the idea by just seeing it. Um, so I've got here my ocean spray juice bottle. Cut it. Invert it. And then you would take some tape. And I'm not going to do this all the way, but I'm just going to share the idea. And put some tape, like so. Tape it all the way around. And then you can put at the bottom about a quarter inch to half an inch of water with if, if they're attracted to sweetness. Because what these yellow jackets, and we're talking about not just yellow jackets, but yellow jackets, hornets, and, um, and wasp. Same family, pretty much. If some scientist is watching this, they're going to say they're not in the same family. But they all similarly, as adults, go for sweetness. But they go after your hamburgers and your steaks when you're cooking in the backyard because you're using that to feed their larvae. And that's the reason that they're eating those insects that are in your garden as well, is to feed their larvae, which is typically from spring through summer. Um, and then in the winter, the populations typically die down. Um, so we've got about another month or two, and then you'll notice the issue is gone. Um, but what this will do is you can tape around it, put something sweet if you think they're attracted to something sweet, put a piece of your hamburger down there and some water so that once they get in there, they drown. And this here would be more local and control maybe that one wasp I was trying to catch a couple of weeks ago and instead, you know, or yellow jacket and end up trapping 30. Um, so this here would be a less invasive way of controlling the populations rather than destroying all of Lindo Street um, populations. The water level, is it, do you put the water level below the... Um... Yeah, so your water level would be like down here. You got to leave enough room for it to enter from the top, loop around, and then once it gets tired enough, fall into the water. So ideally, this should have been up maybe a little bit higher. And if you wanted to, you can actually maybe put a strip across the top to make it a little bit narrower, easier for it to come in, but harder for it to find its way out. But usually when they're trying to come out, they're usually trying to come out around the edges. They're not going to find that hole again at the bottom. Chances are, and it's going to end up drowning by the time. And I've seen a few people successfully use this as an alternative to those traps. And I brought my water bottle being, you can do the same thing. You just invert the top, put it down, leave a little water at the bottom, hang the top from a tree. I hope that's pretty self-explanatory. But you can do something that's homemade and be less damaging to your surrounding wildlife. Um, so yes? I was going to say well, on that same topic. If you're having a barbecue or whatever, eating outside, bees come because busted the tracks of this. Oh, it's so annoying when and that happens. What we have done is just take dryer strips and put them on the table, a few here, and nothing will come in. Dryer strips? You mean the Those fabric softeners? You put it yeah. yeah, you put them in little yeah. glasses and just put it around you and nothing will come here. Yeah. So that's an idea. We've, we've worn Bounce. them in bras and panties and pockets <laughs> when you go to Africa or some places where you don't want or to. Or the LA that. Zoo. My last time we got chased <laughs> out of there because of them. That's yeah. very yeah. true. It was horrible. In the summer, like there's notices everywhere. They're like, you enter at your own risk. Yeah. It's really, really bad. I can't even convince my daughter to get a snow cone or an ice cream cone there because they'll run right after you. <laughs> um, 
So we talk about yellow jackets, sticky paper is another way, um, ant baits, tangle foot is something you can actually um, wrap around your tree trunk to keep ants and other insects from crawling up your plant. Um, but it's tricky because you're going to create like a band-aid around your plant and then you got to be careful about as your plant grows, you got to make sure you adjust for it, otherwise you're strangling your tree. Um, I can give more examples about that later if you have any questions. For moles, um, voles, gophers, and rats, um, my second choice is to use steel traps, which would be you're now doing something like this. You're familiar with the rat trap, the mouse trap, another mouse trap over here. Um, this here is a, a vole trap, but what you're ultimately doing, and I want to see if there's anything else. Um, the rat zapper I didn't bring with me. But yeah, there's also a zapper where the rat walks into it and gets electrocuted and dies. Um, here's another one that's a gasser. Um, the, the, and here's another one. But it, I'll tell you why I'm not a fan of all of these things. Um, and here's, actually I'm not talking about this one yet. So all the things I shared right now are actually things that catch the animal and ideally quickly kill it, it with that type of treatment. Um, the goal being is that you're only catching what you're desiring to catch and, and it's contained compared to what I'm going to get to with step three. Um, there's another option which is catch and releases which is where you catch the animal um, and if some of you have some ideas and you want to write these on your survey, I found a couple of companies online but I can't recommend any, but are there any companies that will actually help haul away that squirrel you caught, that raccoon you caught, that possum you caught, and I know there's services that LA will do for you and take them away from your property and probably just move it next door. I actually heard that they seriously move them to another, like, like back into the wilderness, wherever that is. Um, so if somebody has a suggestion for, for that so I can finish the thought, I would appreciate it. And then poison. I wrote poison is your last choice of control for everything. In your garden, um, poisons kill everything. And the example I got here with me today is this which some of you maybe have seen. It's basically like a sand that you would scatter around your garden, around your house, and it basically says on the back, it says, kills over 100 insects. And the pictures that it shows is, you know, it's gonna kill ticks. Sure, we don't want ticks on us. Cinch bugs, moles and crickets, ants, and then it put a cutworm, but the cutworm is a caterpillar. And then it says it kills over 100 insects. What are the other guys? They're obviously killing everything. It's killing everything. You're basically saying, I want no insects around my property, whether they're good or bad. And that actually causes more damage than good. Not just forget about the biology, but you've really caused the ecology in your backyard alone. If you're just looking at your home, you've messed it up to the point that the aphids will now take over control before the next praying mantis, the next beetle, the next anything will come back to keep things in check. So um, think long and hard before you take poison as an option for controlling. And then the poisons are, I shared that one. There's this that you can spray, um, spray spectricide. Um, there's this, another popular name brand, Seven. This one here also says, kills over a 100 listed insects and it's showing the caterpillar on there and the beetle. What are ladybugs? Any guess? Yeah, well, they're beetles. But they're beetles too. They're beetles, so it's going to kill, it says beetles as well. So um, you're killing everything when you spray this in your garden. So even though it's showing pictures of the things you want to get rid of, it's doing more than just that. Um, and then now for your moles, voles, gophers, and rats. Um, here are some choices. One being, I've got these worms. They're glow in the dark like worms that you put in the ground. The mole thinks it's a real earthworm, chews it up, and gets poisoned. Here's one idea. Another is this. They're like granola bars made for gophers. You stick this entire granola bar into the ground and it eats it and dies. And, and here's another one. Moles and gophers. Poison peanuts. So again, another poison. You use the end to basically poke a hole into the ground to try to find where that tunnel is and then you dump some poison in the hole and cover it up. What's happening with all of these products, if you research them, they all say keep them away from your fruit trees, keep them away from your vegetable trees, because what your essence in doing first is you're contaminating your soil. So you've now just 
not just poison the animal, but you poisoned yourself. So, and most people, and I've seen people using these products near their food, are not thinking before they're even putting it in their garden. They're just focused on, got to kill this guy. But think about what you're doing to your plants that are ultimately going into you too. And all of these say, or they don't say anything at all as it relates to keeping them away from your food because they are poisons. Um, I'm going to read this off the list because um, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. You've just introduced... That's on here. I just want to make sure I didn't miss it. So you got this poison. Um, so I said, now that you've got this poison gopher that's also going to kill and will kill the hawk, the coyote, the mountain lion, the mountain lion, and also your neighbor's cat. The poison is very random. You can't control it. The reason I, as mean as this sounds, to use a metal trap to like go and stick it in the hole and catch it. It's the safest thing for the community. If your goal is to catch it, you catch it. The step before this is the repellents, but I actually opt for option two, in my opinion, and I'm gonna give it, even though I don't like saying it. Um, but option two is one critter can damage your entire backyard, just one. It might look like there's 100, but it's just one guy, and they'll tunnel 10, 20 feet a day and, and basically divert water that's, that's irrigating your plants. Um, all you have to do is get rid of that one guy. Um, repellents may work, but by getting rid of it, you've controlled your area of that one thing. Um, the poisons, again, it's damaging the entire system, and it's, it's like shooting a dart, you know, a, dart, a dart in the dark, being you don't know what you're going to hit, you don't know what you're going to kill. It's not just the animal. It's going to move. It's going to die in the walls of every house. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to do some other damage aside from just killing that animal. Um, I talked about your fruits and vegetables and how you're poisoning yourself too. Um, and hence, it's the last choice. Um, the last thing I want to share with you guys, do you have any questions before we kind of wrap it up? Yes, Ken. Yeah, so Ken was saying um, using like a Tabasco sauce. You can actually add Tabasco sauce to a sprayer and use that as a repellent. Yes, if you take a look at the back of this can, and I'll read it. All of these oils actually accomplish that with the exception of castor oil, which is actually in there for the purpose of the, some farmers actually up in Washington that are using it now in their apple trees. Because in the winter, the rats, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else, uh, but I think it's predominantly rats, and I've heard some rabbits in other um, orchards, they'll actually gnaw on the bottom of the trees. They'll actually girdle all the way around the tree. Once you girdle the bark off the tree and get to the cambium layer, which is where the sugars and the sweetness is that the, the animals are getting to, you've now just interfered with the flow of the water and the juices up and down the tree. So you've shortened the life of the tree, if not killed it that one year. So castor oil, which is in this product, which is the same as in this product, which repels rodents, once they actually start gnawing on the tree, they're going to get a mouthful of castor oil and leave that tree alone. But the other oils that are in here include, I'm going to read real quick, um, cinnamon oil as a bug repellent, um, clove oil, cedarwood oil, garlic oil, peppermint oil, rosemary oil. So you can imagine once you've got all of these barriers on the plant, if an insect's thinking at all about entering, there's too many things that are repellent naturally for it to want to get into the plant. So, um, but yeah, and, and Tabasco would be another way. And I mentioned also with repellents when it comes to rodents that there are pepper-based products to also repel rodents um, out, of your, out of your garden. Um, Yes. Another um, source of damage that you get after gophers and moles is that uh, they have left tunnels in the ground. And when there are heavy rains, those tunnels get built and, and gush. And if you're on the edge of a hillside, they can break it off. We had a landscape gardener who used to, uh, when he saw the, the dirt turned up where the gopher came in or out of, and found the tunnel between. He'd have one of the laborers take a, uh, what's that tool that looks like a mallet, but it's really heavy. He basically like compacted it, some, like yes, a sledgehammer. He would, a sledgehammer. Yeah. And, and they would sledge, they would knock, break down the, the soil tunnels. from the top to fill in the hole, and then you'd have to add some and re A lot of work. But, um, but it can save a lot of damage. If, if you have, have serious gopher issues. John. Well, being a pro gopher killing, I've tried cut glass and poison. 
The only thing that's going to get rid of them is that trap. And it's a set of a gun I use. You've got to put your hand in the tunnel. You have to tie a string on it because the gopher will run with it to his tunnel if it just gets his leg. So you tie a string and tie it to a screwdriver in the ground. But that's the only way you're going to get rid of the gopher. Because that's why I hate this stuff too. It sounds gruesome and it's well, horrible. Well, you got to do it or all. Look, you saw what the, it did to the tree. In well, the in my garden, I had yeah. a two-year-old lemon tree that had about 100, 200 lemons, and it was one of these critters. I think it was a mole that girdled the tree, killed it. Like it was dead within a matter of a month or two, yeah. with over 200 lemons on it. Two-year-old tree. Um, another instance that again, it, I had gophers at the beginning. My property is walls on all sides. Um, I think they fall off the wall into my properties, how they arrive once or twice a year. But it's usually moles. I actually have moles. I don't know if you know what a mole looks like. Um, but I was surprised to see this face. But it's exactly this guy um, on here. It's got webbed feet, pretty much blind. It's got a cute little nose that protrudes a little bit pink. Um, what else can I say about this thing? And it's typically about this big. It would be otherwise like a little hamster, the cutest little thing in the world. But damage wise, 10 to 20 feet a day of digging tunnels they're typically identified not unlike gophers that create those mounds you'll usually find them like there'll be a break in the soil everywhere it goes they're usually just a half an inch underneath the soil level so as they're tunneling the soil will crack um, and that's actually how I caught the last one I was able to go with the shovel and just scoop them right out and, and, I, and I caught it that way um, again because as they move they're, the, the, that line moves as well with them um, but what they do that's the most damaging is they divert water from your plants. They usually like to camp around the root balls of all of your trees in your garden. So they'll sit there and tunnel and tunnel and tunnel, eat all of the um, earthworms, maybe gnaw on some of the roots of the trees, depending, I know between moles and voles, one of them also eats plants. So one of them will actually go for the juices in the, in the plant, whereas the other one's more insect based. Um, but the major damage is you've lost all of the soil around the root ball of your plant. And all of a sudden you'll notice your plant's starting to dry out. You might keep watering, but it's just not enough. It's getting diverted through the tunnels and going elsewhere. So you're going to have to just like Eileen said, you have to go in there and compact all of these holes instead of using a, um, what was that word again? We just said it. Instead of using a sledgehammer, I usually go with a bucket of compost next to me and soak the area and manually with my hands with rubber gloves on um, and just start forcing the soil back in and around that root ball because if I step on it, the whole tree is going to sink. And that would actually do more damage to your tree than good because now you've reduced the, um, the level that that plant was used to growing at. Um, and if you put it low and then you cover it with soil, you're now suffocating your plant. You want to keep it at the same zone and the only way to do that is, for what I found, is manually doing it. Um, I quickly, quickly want to share the importance of lemons. I did a whole page on, on it for you as well. Um, and when you come to my garden in the future garden class, which I'm hoping to have in the next um, couple of seasons, um, I just noticed that I planted nine lemon trees. Seven of them as I use as a hedge that are about six to seven feet tall. Um, and then two of them that are standard um, because my family uses that many lemons. There's not a day that goes by that I don't use a lemon. And I know uh, a couple of you have been generous in giving me your excess um, until I can have, hopefully have enough in my own garden. So I can also give back to you guys. Um, but a lemon a day can help keep the doctor away. And I'm not quoting to be a doctor, um, even though I was pre-med once upon a time. Um, but I wrote at the very bottom the website where I got this, so I can give them the credit and not me. But to quickly share with you, um, lemons have vitamin C as do all citrus, you know, work against infections such as the flus and colds, and it neutralizes free radicals linked to aging and most types of diseases. Um, it's good for your liver. Um, it cleans your bowels. I'm not gonna go into detail. Scurvy, we have all heard about. Brain disorders, we probably did not hear um, about. Hiking at higher elevations, I was thinking, thinking about Sandy for this one. Um, there's um, a study where this person was able to climb higher, mm -hmm. drinking water with lemon in it. Um, powerful antibacterial properties, it kills a lot of bacteria. Strengthen your blood vessels. And, um, and the last point is the most important, as we've all have people in our families, and I know I can say this with 100% certainty, that have had cancer. Um, and my family's dealt with in the last you know, couple of years and luckily successfully. Um, but lemon was an important part of the diet, the everyday diet, as um, these lemons have up to 22 anti-cancer compounds in it. Um, what I've learned in the study of cancer and watching what um, this particular family member had to go through is it was all, it was all organic and garden-based 
foods. It's if you go back to whether or not you believe in God or Mother Nature or whomever, um, the point is everything that makes you healthy, I don't want to say happy, but healthy is in your garden. And you should be growing um, first, my first criteria in the garden is grow the things that are expensive. Don't grow potatoes. <laughs> grow, even tomatoes can be cheap sometimes too, but not the organic ones. Um, so grow your own tomatoes, grow your own avocados, grow your own, um, you know, your lemons. They're a dollar a piece sometimes at, you know, if you're shopping at the wrong place like I do. Um, so, and I'm not even talking about organic lemons, but this is just at the local grocery store. Um, but the point is grow the things that cost money, grow the things so you can have an organic garden. And we talked about a lot of ways to create that organic California with a blend California native garden in your property. Um, and make sure you're feeding things organically. We talked about, you know, a chemical fertilizer versus an organic fertilizer and the benefits. Um, you know, and the goal is to create superior food to ultimately take care of your health. I mean, if you go back to the history of things and before there was fast food, um, you would have to grow your own food. That was the old way of people living is you growed the things that you ate and you, you know, and you lived a healthier life apparently even though we're living longer now. Um, but the goal is to bring those good things from your garden into your bodies and, you know, and to increase your awareness. Yeah. I just want to tell you a really good trick with lemons. If you have too many or you're not going to use them, put them in your freezer and then you can grate them. Lemon rind actually has more nutrients than the lemon yeah. itself. And you lemon just grate, um, grate them on any, in anything you're going to use lemon for and they're, they last forever. So Deborah said um, you can grate the lemon rinds and use that as value. Um, Someone actually said right before the class to squeeze the lemon juice that's excess and turn those into a, a you know an ice cube ice with cube trays and use those um, in the future as well. And yeah. incorporate the lemon zest with that, yeah. so that you can. It's actually ten times more vitamin C in the rind than the lemon. Rind. Does that go for limes as well? So yeah. So the rule applies to all citrus. If you go to the website that I gave you as it relates to citrus, that last website says. Um, there's another point after that last point I wrote um, that talks about lemons being the only fruit that has a negative ion, which makes it like they say, like a one of a kind fruit on earth and they attribute its magical properties to the fact that it has this negative ion that can't be found in any other fruits or vegetables. Um, so does it apply to all of the citrus? I want to say yes, but according to the research on that particular website, if you go there, um, there's one thing that lemons has that no, nothing else does, aside from the flavor. <laughs> but yeah. I wanted to say, all of my friends that we go uh, hiking, you know, every Sunday and Tuesday and Thursday, whatever. Yeah. We all squeeze some lemon, or a slice of lemon in our water bottles. Number one, it's sometimes hard to drink water, but if you put some kind of flavoring in it, and lemon's the best one, then you can drink a lot of water, which we all need a lot of anyway. That's true. Yeah. So. If I can have a volunteer to help me collect the surveys, and then we're going to do a quick drawing. And what a, what, yeah, we're going to do the seeds and all that in just a minute. I'm going to have Jerry as a helper. Um, but what I want to share also that we missed that will automatically go on to next winter's topic is what's called the wimpy plant test. And you notice that I've got some plants up here, um, one being a strawberry plant, Another being a sage plant. I'm just going to do a quick intro. Uh, a tomato plant. And then I've got this aloe vera type plant called uh, gold tooth aloe. And the point of the wimpy plant test is to identify a plant that will help you quickly and easily read the plant so that you can know when to water your plant without having to stick your knuckles in the pot or use a watering meter. How many of you here have potted plants on your property? Should be almost everybody. Um, and do any of you stick your fingers in the soil to determine when it's time to water? So a lot of nodding. And then do any of you have a watering meter that you use instead? So again, about half of you. Um, so what's the idea behind the Wimpy plant test? And if you want to see it earlier, you can go to the YouTube channel for Ivy Organic. And you'll see in there's over 70 plus videos there. And part of your PowerPoint also talks about Ivy Organics and the benefits. But um, I really want to get into more depth at a later date because I don't have the time today. Um, but the goal behind the Wimpy plant test is to be able to plant a, a plant next to your potted plant. And in this situation, it was the Meyer lemon. And then we added next to it this strawberry. 
And the reason we added the strawberry, aside from the fact that we're enjoying now, you know, some strawberry fruits, in addition to lemons that are coming pretty soon, um, is this. The strawberry plant has a weak root system. It's a fibrous root system. It typically grows about two, three, four inches. So instead of your finger, these roots will tell you when there's no water and the leaf will begin to quickly wilt. When the leaves wilt, that's your indication that it's time to water. You water the plant and when you water it, you water it well to the point that you get some water in the saucer but the saucer needs to dry up as well within 24 hours, otherwise you're now rotting the soil again. So no water, no more water than whatever will fill up in there. Um, don't lay an egg. Don't lay an egg. Okay, fine, you can. It actually is. It really is right now. Did you plan that or? They hired it. <laughs> to identify the monarch butterflies, I just bought a bunch of plants, milkweeds, and they had all kinds of things on I don't know, so I looked up what is a monarch butterfly. I mean, what Egg is, looks like? But it's just like a little single white. The expert's right here. I'll, I'll so you two I'll, get together. I'll tell you, uh, I know everything. This is called the swallowtail butterfly. Yeah. And they're actually on the endangered species as well, just to let you know. It's not all about the monarch. Another reason for planting the California natives is to support all butterflies in your community, to support all the bees in your community, to support everything that's good and bad in your community. So this girl's really at it. Anyways. So, so we selected the, um, the strawberry plant over a plant like this, the aloe vera, which if I didn't water that potted plant, my lemon tree would die first. And if I didn't water that lemon tree at the right time, the leaves would not even you know, wilt or anything unless it was new growth. It might just go from green to yellow to brown without even showing any indication of stress other than a changing color. This won't help me at all. You guys all understand why, right? It's a succulent. It can go more without water than that citrus tree. Um, a tomato plant. How deep do these roots typically go? Any idea? What? 10 inches? When it's full grown, how far can it go? If the soil was loose enough, it can travel about 6 to 10 feet. So the tomato roots are quite invasive. If I put it in that pot, the roots would coil and wrap around all around the plant. And the tomato plant is going to be a big plant. Even if it was a tomato bush, it would be, that maybe would be a choice. But again, the roots are too strong to go around it. Um, so the tomato was not selected, even though it does show pretty good signs of stress and the leaves do wilt pretty quickly without water. Um, and the last one that I brought was this garden sage. And garden sage fails the test for a couple of reasons. One being, again, it has a deep root system. It's very woody. It can grow to about two to three feet tall, so it's a large plant. Um, and sage, maybe not this garden sage variety, is, I don't know if it's um, native or not. I didn't do my research on this particular variety. Um, but if you plant any type of sage, they're typically drought tolerant. So they're going to perform stronger once it's established in the pot. Again, the citrus could be starving for water and you wouldn't even know it. So sage was also voted out. And that's the reason that you'll find the strawberry plant on the side of it. Um, for our giveaway, are all of your surveys in there? So what I'm going to do is have our hostess. Is she around? Or is she gone? So we'll have Deborah be the lucky drawer. And let me tell you before you draw, let me tell you, let me tell you. The winner is actually going to get that Meyer lemon tree that's still wrapped up and not potted yet. So you're going to take that home and if you need help planning it, I'll be there for you. Um, and all my contact information is at the last page. Um, so that last Meyer lemon tree is for you. The one I brought is actually my gift to the hostess. Um, and that's one giveaway. The other thing I want to share with you guys too is the second drawing will get this, which is um, a can of the Ivory Organics, retail value, $29. And, the, and then the third thing you guys are going to do is you're going to pick up your plants and your seeds in the corner. You're going to pick up some snail bait as well, which are organic. And then when you see me, take about a pinch of this out as well. Um, and this here is basically a mix of all these other California native flowers as well. So add that to your poppy mix, or if you want to put in a, another pocket, you know, somewhere. Um, but I want you guys to take 
some more stuff to your gardens because you never know what's going to work the best and what's not. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this video and if, and if so, be sure to like it and most importantly, subscribe down below so you don't miss any of our other videos that usually come out once every three months and sometimes as frequently as once a month. So please be sure to subscribe and happy gardening.